for us, we want the students to come out of here with aptitudes embodied in what wisdom and decisiveness is defined as here. Confident humility. You want to be confident in what you know and where you are, but really be humble in knowing the boundaries of what you know and don't know and have the confidence to say, I don't know. Many years ago, I worked for a couple years in the U.S. government. I wasn't in the Oval Office every day, but I spent a fair bit of time in the Oval Office briefing. This is 05 to 07, the president and others. And before I went in for my first briefing to run, I remember my boss at the time was Ben Bernanke, the chair of CEA. And he said, Matt, the most important thing to remember, you say no when you don't know the answer to a question. But it comes back to like an academic. When you're in an academic seminar, the NBER, these universities, you don't bluff. You don't BS. You just, I don't know is the right answer sometimes. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. This is your friendly reminder also that today is a great day to be alive. And if things aren't going super awesome for you today, maybe just take a second to sit down or stand up and take a breath. And remember, today is a gift. My guest today is Matt Slaughter. He's the dean of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, which happens to be my alma mater, my business school alma mater. We talk about a lot of different things today, but the thing we talk about the most is how business schools can help students become not just better business people, but better people. And I think you'll find his perspective both interesting and refreshing. Stick around for Matt Slaughter. First, I want to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Sidecar. Did you know that Mother's Day is coming up on May 9th? Even if you kind of knew it was coming, do you have a gift yet for the fashionable mom in your life? You should. You better darn get one. And guess what? Sidecar is a perfect solution for the hat wearing love of your life. There are six different ways to wear your sidecar. This beautiful hand-stitched leather and gold-plated clip is not only an incredible practical way, it is a very fashionable way to carry your hat while you travel. Sidecarlove.com. The link is in the show notes. You should also know that this company was co-founded by my wife. So if you love the show, by the transitive property, you love me and I love her, so you love her, so you should buy a sidecar. See the link in the show notes. Hey, I want to say thank you to everybody who came out to the show at Mad Life Stage and Studios in Woodstock last week. Great turnout. I had a lot of fun because of the love that was in the room. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm very excited to announce that I will be opening for Styx, the band Styx and Collective Soul on the road June 18th through 27th in Atlanta, Memphis, Jackson, Mississippi, Lincoln, Nebraska, Kansas City, Kansas, Camdenton, Missouri, I believe that would be in the Ozarks. And O-K-C-O-K-L-A-H-O-M-A, Oklahoma. Super excited. I get to open for a band that I heard on the radio from the time I was like seven until I can't remember when. Forever, pretty much. So if you're going to go to those shows, get there early because I'll be going on before Collective Soul, who will also be putting on a killer show. So by all means, get there early and listen to me tell jokes. All right. You know, I want to talk to you about business school and why it mattered to me. So when I was 25, I was getting by, barely paying my bills as a young man in Memphis, Tennessee, and really had been through this experience like, wow, this adulting thing is harder than I thought it would be. My father did me the great service of after graduating from college saying, good luck, you are no longer on the payroll. And by doing that, he forced me to figure things out on my own. He also prepared me by ensuring that I had a bachelor's degree that I would enter the world with, and I was not saddled with any student loans. So in that way, I was very well off, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do with my career. And I went back to business school at age 26, and it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. I wrote a book a few years back called You Should Totally Get an MBA, and I was often asked if that title was a joke, and it wasn't. I'm not a shill for the massive business school industrial complex. I just really thought that that was the right degree for me to get at that time in my life. I needed a little direction. I needed to be surrounded by people who were both very motivated, very smart, and had a depth of experience and a breadth of experience in industries I had not yet been exposed to. And those two years gave me the opportunity to spend a little time in a different part of the world with some of the most fantastic people I'd ever met. I liked my classmates so much. I was challenged and inspired by my professors. I had just a great time, and I am proud to wear the dark green that is associated with with all Dartmouth sweatshirts and hoodies for the rest of my life. But what really surprised me wasn't how smart my classmates were or how motivated they were, but but how good they were as people, how kind, how family-oriented 
they were and how they sincerely all wanted to contribute to making the world a better place. And so I find it both surprising and off-putting on an emotional level when I encounter people in the world who just assume that business people are slimy, selfish, and short-sighted. I just don't get it. I worked in industry for 15 years after business school for Launch.com, Yahoo, and Facebook, and the hundreds or thousands of people, out of the hundreds or thousands of people that I met in my business dealings, I can think of maybe eight or nine people that I found to be ethically compromised. I really found most people that when you're working for really good companies, you have to be a long-term thinker or you won't stick around very long. And so I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Matt Slaughter, who is not only an incredible teacher, but incredibly respected and experienced in the world of research and publishing around globalization and other topics. In addition to being the dean of the Tuck School, he served in President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. He is a really accomplished guy. Let me read his more formal bio here. Matthew J. Slaughter is the Paul Danos Dean of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, where he is also the Earl C. Daum 1924 Professor of International Business. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a member of the Academic Advisory Board of the International Tax Policy Forum. Those guys party. You know they do. Oh, he's also an academic advisor to the McKinsey Global Institute. He's ridiculously smart. He's ridiculously well-respected. Matt received his bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Notre Dame, and his doctorate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There is a link to Matt's publishing in the show notes. I hope you'll go there and check it out. Until then, please enjoy this conversation with Matt Slaughter. Matt Slaughter, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. So Matt, in my online research for this interview, Google surfaced many references to slaughters, including <laughs> yes. pro wrestler Sergeant Slaughter, musician Mark Slaughter of the heavy metal band Slaughter, which I think we Indeed. can agree is a pretty good name for a heavy metal band, and David Slaughter of Slaughter's Barbecue Oasis in Sulphur Springs, Texas, which looks pretty fantastic. What is the etymology of the Slaughter name? Sadly, I will say I'm unrelated to any of those three individuals. <laughs> also, a bit older, perhaps often ask Eno Slaughter, who very famously in the 1946 World Series for the St. Louis Cardinals scored, I believe it was on from first base on a single. So scampered around the bases and helped secure a win. That's so, what Bob Costas would have asked you first. Yeah, no, exactly. Most of my heritage is Irish, actually. I think both in Ireland and in England, you can find villages. There's a pair called Upper and Lower Slaughter. I can't remember where exactly in which of those two, but it comes from, and you can imagine you know, what my ancestors did for work in and around the abattoirs. I have a gaggle of high school friends. Among them, a nickname I have is Slafter rather than Slaughter because I'm not huge. I'm slight at build. And so they just think it's ironic that someone of my name, who's not say a linebacker in the NFL has this build. So oftentimes they'll call me Slafter. The Slaughter. So that's a much beefier, no pun intended name than like Cooper or Smith. I mean, that's a real man's last name. Yeah, totally. That's exactly right. Yes. There was a toil done an honest labor in the ancestry. So where did you grow up and how would your high school classmates describe you? Uh, I grew up in a little suburb of the Twin Cities called Minnetonka, Minnesota, born in a suburb called Robbinsdale, but from my kind of earliest memories, grew up in Minnetonka. Graduated from a great class of Minnetonka High School in 1986. I almost had two older brothers, mom and dad, and in The Economist me, I'll say, it was this, I'm very fortunate, this kind of idyllic childhood of the American dream. My parents had worked very hard and had achieved success in a lot of the ways we usually measure you know, my dad's dad, my grandfather, had to drop out of school in eighth grade when his dad died in the early 1920s. No social security yet in this country. And he had to work to support his mom and um, his younger siblings. I think my high school buddies, we have an annual reunion called the Grumpy Man Blues Weekend, where we go up to northern Minnesota, play bad golf and a lot of euchre and solve all the world's problems. I think if I use the pantheon of the Winnie the Pooh characters, they would describe me as a tigger, kind of glass half full, positive disposition person. Oh. Not a good golfer. Amazing. They have never lost a Euchre game in the 35-ish years we've been doing this reunion. So, Now that you mentioned the Winnie the Pooh pantheon, I'm afraid you're talking to Eeyore. 
on some level. Got it. So we can work on that. I think our world needs <laughs> not in a not in a naive or Panglossian sense, but we need some more tigger in our world. I think there's too little hope and opportunity. Yeah, so. I know. I like it. I like it. Why did you choose to study economics? In part because I was able to take advantage of the one of the strengths of American higher ed. Not that it doesn't have its issues, is you can change. So my very first class I went to Notre Dame as an undergraduate was an introductory to engineering class. I remember sitting through it and literally about halfway through thinking, okay, this is not for me. This is not the major. And so I walked out of the class, went to the freshman year of studies and switched. I switched into a government class. And just as I moved through my studies, just issues of kind of justice in the world were of interest to me. And economics has a lot to do with that. I came to realize in terms of just supply and demand and market forces and thinking back to you know my dad's work and, and growing up in Minnetonka, it's this uh, quaint little suburb of the Twin Cities. It's bigger now. But even that, a lot of global connectivity in and around there. So Tonka trucks were invented in Mentaka, Minnesota, thus the name, rollerblades, and one of the world's largest global business enterprises, Cargill, as a food and kind of commodities firm, their headquarters, world headquarters is like two miles from where I grew up. And so you developed a specialty in globalization and economics. Was what you learned along the way consistent with what you thought you would find as you made your way into it? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I think a lot of the issues of, again, justice, opportunity, equality in our world revolve around how the global economy works. And so that's kind of what I got interested in as an undergraduate. That's why I went to graduate school. The no is, I think, in my home discipline, wearing the kind of academic hat of economics, we were far too slow in, I think, glossing over the reality, which is globalization broadly defined does not directly benefit every single worker and firm and community. And I think too much of the academic research and frankly, kind of folks who've interacted with public policy, even if they acknowledge that, they thought, well, that's really easy to fix. You simply have a fiscal system of taxes and transfers that can make sure that the quote, winners of globalization or other dynamic forces like technology innovation can compensate the quote, losers. And I put quotes there because I think that even the language choices that I remember hearing in school in early days of being an academic they're not great choices uh, when we recognize the, the sobering reality. And we see it when you go up into northern Minnesota. Like I mentioned, you see a very different economic journey than what you see in the Twin Cities area. Now, in your career, in addition to many other things, you've been a teacher, a researcher, and an administrator. What's required to be successful in each of those respective endeavors? Oof. As a teacher, I admit, I think I speak for a lot of the my terrific faculty colleagues at Tuck. It's a joy. There's a secret that a lot of teachers hold on to, which is how much energy we draw from and inspiration we draw from the students. But I think the more successful ones, especially in higher education, that view themselves as partners in co-creating knowledge as opposed to sage on the stage. The world doesn't need more sages on the stage. And by the way, with technology, through things like this podcast, you can get all the sages you want, infinite supply and zero cost. I think for scholarship, for research, you really kind of have to have this two things, this dogged determination to dig into subjects, to go beyond anecdote and assertion and try to understand cause and effect in a deeper sense. But the second thing you need to have, and it's true, I think in all the academic disciplines is you really have to have this kind of confidence and comfort with being told no and being criticized all the time. The peer review process on how knowledge is advanced in our world is remarkably productive, but it's also remarkably bracing. (laughs) When you go and present your research to other scholars and they tell you the 17 things that are wrong with page one, you really have to have a kind of an ability to absorb that and see that as fun. And I think as an administrator, the thing I would say is, I think you have to have a deep sense of stewardship. I view my role, I'm lucky to serve as dean here coming up at the end of year six at Tuck. I think of it as I'm stewarding the institution for all the stakeholders, alums like you and current students, faculty colleagues, future students, the broader Dartmouth campus. And I think that our world is getting a lot more complex. And I think that ability to be comfortable with that complexity in your decision making as an administrator is essential. I actually have written down here later in the interview, how do you balance the priorities of all the different stakeholders, each of whom believes them to be the most important constituency? Yeah, yeah. And and what's interesting in higher education, like a lot of other not-for-profits, is you don't have sort of the magic of the market of market signals telling you where strategy should go. I, I love thinking of strategy as a metaphor of what direction you want the organization to move in when you've got some mission and ideal vision for what you are in succeeding once you get there. But in a company, it's easy to say, 
if the blue widgets are selling, the red widgets aren't. We're not <laughs> going to make as many red widgets. You remember this from Matt Eck in your classes here. We're only eight minutes in and you said widgets. I'm so proud of you. I, just, <laughs> yeah, so I, love I know this. what your over under was on the best. So, uh, <laughs> but you don't have that in not for profits and especially in higher ed. And there's just an earnest love that a lot of alums bring to our school. And, and so I guess it's another footnote on it. Being an administrator, you have to get comfortable telling people no. And that's not mean. It's just being able to articulate what the strategy is. I think of decisions and directions. They're all just bundles of risk and return. It's different. I have over here, one of my high school buddies gave me a picture of Dean Wormer from, if you call the movie Animal House, which sits <laughs> yeah, in my, next to my, by my desk. It's not that, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just putting people on double secret probation. Yeah. I think Dean Danos would have referred to me as Blutowski in this situation, if he knew who I was Yes, 0.0 exactly. is not a great GPA, Paul. Let's quote a little John Stuart Mill to get us going into the deep conversation here. He said, the object of universities is not to make skillful lawyers, physicians, or engineers. It is to make capable and cultivated human beings. Assuming Mill would include business people in the sentiment behind the quote, how will studying business help one become a better person? I love that quote. It will help you because it empowers you to have the tools to understand how our modern world works and to better it. So our mission statement at Tuck, which I really like, it, we crafted it I like language. So these 11 words really matter. Tuck develops wise, decisive leaders who better the world through business. Business does not solve all the ills of the world. In fact, it can't by design. We need to have strong, well-financed governments that address a lot of the public goods and needs. And yet, you know, if you look at human standards of living on whatever basic measures, you go back literally centuries and centuries, and there was almost no progress. And then over the last roughly you know, 250, now approaching 300 years, you see this dramatic acceleration and growth of standards of living. And it has a lot to do with the creation and a kind of legal regime and societal regime that allows the pursuit of profit through business to actually deliver rising standards of living. So knowing more about business, and we see this definitely in our students and the organizations that hire them, they're going to be in companies, but they're also in maybe late in their life and also as part of their lives when they're working for businesses, they're going to be engaging with sovereign governments and civil society in a way that when it's done properly, helps better our world. There are many people out there who would be quite cynical of that assertion. So let's say you're at a dinner party. And you're seated next to a journalist who writes for the New York Times and the New Yorker. And the journalist finds out what you do for a living. And he says to you, quote, in my experience, people who are successful in business are generally quite limited. In fact, I think general intelligence and curiosity are huge barriers to financial success. How would you respond to that? I would start by saying one of the biggest learnings I've had as a teacher and a practitioner is how time and again, the strongest organizations and businesses, and yes, that's in a financial metric sense, but also I think in the broader contributions to all stakeholders, how time and again, the leaders of these organizations and the, you know, the boards, the owners of these organizations stress that what they're seeking in their managers and leaders is lifelong learners. I could give you lots of examples of where I just hear these metaphors of we are seeking a learning animal. We are seeking an individual who has confident humility. Yes, they need to know certain things, but more importantly, they have the humility to understand what are the boundaries of their knowledge and how to build high-performing teams around them to complement what they don't know. So I think there's sometimes this canard that CEOs or other business executives in the world have landed in the dark of night from another planet and they don't have the same <laughs> values, moral compasses, interests as humans to grow. And I think that's just completely wrong. So this was a tweet, as I may have tipped off in our previous correspondence, but this was an actual tweet, that quote from Adam Davidson, who is a pretty well-known journalist in the United States. And he's ironically the co-founder of NPR's Planet Money and authored a book called The Passion Economy. Where do you think people like him come up with this notion? He says he's observing this in the people he meets. And I'm like, you got to meet better people because it's completely inconsistent (laughs) with my personal experience, or maybe I'm the dumb guy who doesn't know he's the dumb guy at the table. Yeah. No, good question. I'll think about it. Like sometimes I think about public policy, which is to say, as you recall from your great learning at talk, whether you're looking at human beings or leaders of businesses or different public policy outcomes, there's a distribution. I mean, we can find just like human beings. Can we find narrow minded, uninteresting business leaders? Sure. Can we find 
very values driven, inspiring world and bettering interested business leaders? Absolutely. I think, again, what's very clear is, you know, I guess kind of comes back to the value of the peer review research. There's just a lot of a decretion of, of empirical evidence that shows the strongest organizations, the ones where the employees feel more motivated, the ones that have high innovation measures, outsized financial and sustained at least so financial performance, tend to be the ones where learning in the organizations and learning at the highest levels are central to how they function. So not to disrespect Adam, but yeah, there is an element of, can you go find anecdotes of business leaders who've been imprisoned? Absolutely. I mean, we could do this. <laughs> yes, know, yes. Uh, we can, sure. But again, it, in my mind, I think the question is, what does the distribution look like? And importantly is to come back to the ticker comment earlier, if we're looking to better our world on average, what are the kinds of individuals and behaviors that we're going to reinforce and try to create more? And what can places like Talk and Hire I do to support that? You say companies want to hire lifelong learners. Are you recruiting lifelong learners or are you taking people who have the potential to become lifelong learners and trying to take them to the next level or steepen the curve of their desire to learn? I think it was more the latter. So you know, for us at Tuck, we are looking for people who want to co-invest with us. I stress that verb. So all education investments, they're investments. And so there's risk and hopefully expected return, but it requires effort. And so we're very intentional in our admissions process of speaking to prospective students about our immersive learning community and that we want to know, we described as personal, connected, transformative, personal means Yes, you have a resume of accomplishments, but especially once you've offered admission, we care a lot more about the gaps and the risks you want to try to take and the failures you want to try to undertake in a trusting, collaborative environment for two years with us. And we're going to connect you with great colleagues in the classroom, faculty, students, alums, companies, ideas. And ideally, we want you to transform not just your professional life, but your personal life. I will say this, I'm only half joking to students for, it was probably the case in your class, Paul, if we went and looked at the great class of 97, for almost all of you, that was your last formal education you ever had in your life. There's the, every year, there's about maybe 1% to 2% if you go out 5 to 10 years who went on and maybe earn a PhD in something or go to dental school or veterinary school or something really uh, change. So when you frame it that way, we stress to students, whatever are your learning capabilities, we want to enhance those as best we can in alignment with the mission of our schools. So the next 10, 20, 50 years, a human and financial return on that investment. I did take an afternoon Spanish class a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if you would call that formal education, but... It's lifelong learning. There you go. That being the case, and I think you're right, you clearly have the data, but that makes a ton of sense. You go get your MBA, you're ready to go rock it in the business world. That's going to be your return. You're not looking to go back to school. But what are the values beyond just the four P's and the three C's, if I have those numbers and letters corresponding? <laughs> no, correct? I, I remember them. I'm not sure I could name them, but like beyond those things, what are the values you're really trying to instill in the students that somebody would meet somebody down the road and say, did you go to Tuck because I'm getting this Tuck vibe from you? Yeah. So it comes back to wise, decisive leaders. So for us, we want the students to come out of here with aptitudes embodied in what wisdom and decisiveness is defined as here. Confident humility. You want to be confident in what you know and where you are, but really be humble in knowing the boundaries of what you know and don't know and have the confidence to say, I don't know. Many years ago, I worked for a couple of years in the U.S. government. Not every day, just like my mom or mother-in-law and other people who works in government, their parents think, but I wasn't in the Oval Office every day, but I spent a fair bit of time in the Oval Office briefing. This is 05 to 07, the president and others. And before I went in for my first briefing to run, I remember my boss at the time was Ben Bernanke, the chair of CEA. And he said, Matt, the most important thing to remember you say no when you don't know the answer to a question, but it comes back to like an academics. When you're in an academic seminar at the NBER or at these universities, you don't bluff. You don't BS. You just, I don't know is the right answer sometimes. And I think the perception of business leaders are alpha dogs and they always are blustering their way through life. Empirical evidence shows that's not at all. So that's one of the values I think we really try to teach and really have the students work on building their personal capabilities on. And the second is empathy. It is essential that you can understand the different kind of experiences, ideas, aspirations of people and be able to harness that into high performing teams. Because the research shows diverse experiences and ideas is necessary, but not sufficient to actually get the kind of high performance. You have to actually have a culture around that. So there's key values that we talk about and teamwork is central to it as well, as you recall, Paul. And I think if you go out in the world, you'll tend to hear people talk about Tuck alums is really having a greater awareness and articulation through their action of their values and an orientation around teams rather than just self. So 
the NBA has become kind of like shorthand for describing somebody who is arrogant, selfish, and unfeeling. That to me feels like a bit of a leftover from like the 1980s and Wall Street. Yeah, that's a Wall Street blue horseshoe loves Anna Cup steel thing. <laughs> but in Silicon Valley, and I experienced this myself, I didn't, you know, always volunteer that I had an MBA when I'd meet the engineers when I worked at Yahoo and Facebook because it would almost work against me, right? Certainly mentioning it would work against me. But in Silicon Valley, even the leaders, even very well-known leaders will come out and say, having an MBA isn't important to our company. And then you look at the numbers of MBAs that they hire, and it's staggering. Silicon Valley hires more MBAs than probably any other industry today, as I haven't looked at the numbers recently. So why these conflicting messages? I think it's because it comes back a little bit in my mind to what are the anecdotes and stories we carry in our minds and how representative are they of what success personally and financially really means in the world. So if I think about entrepreneurship, a lot of people have in their mind, oh yeah, the successful entrepreneurs, it's Bill Gates, it's Mark Zuckerberg, both dropouts from college. And then that gets reinforced by voices. Some people, no disrespect against people like Elon Musk or Peter Thiel, amazingly successful, but they publicly said, you know, I don't even know why people need to go to high school maybe. If you've got an idea, you should go with it. The teacher researcher me will say, okay, hmm, Jeff Bezos graduated from Princeton, worked for several years at Bankers Trust and D.E. Shaw before founding Amazon. Uh, Steve Jobs graduated from Reed College, worked at Atari. I don't know if he worked on Pong or whatever, but before founding Apple. And then you go to the research, there's some amazing research lady that has looked at by cobbling together these U.S. government data sets, which are vital for research because they're representative. Again, they capture kind of everybody of founders in the U.S. So there's one cool study recently that looked at the close to 3 million founders in the United States over not quite all, but much of the first generation of this 21st century. All those founders who started a company that went on to hire at least one employee. And not to play Final Jeopardy, but what do you think was the average age of those founders, Paul? I'm thinking you want me to say young age, but it was probably more like 36. Yeah, exactly. So the average age is 42. And then if you go and look at the, again, look at the really successful firms. So move into that distribution the average age for founders in the one in 1,000 highest growth ventures was 45. Founders of startups that successfully exit through an IPO and acquisition were also on average in their mid-40s. And so the research shows, you know, spark of an idea and grit, that, that's great and necessary, I think, in a lot of innovative organizations and in entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurial success has a huge amount to do with individuals' personal and kind of their access to human capital and financial capital and social capital. And a lot of where that comes is through formal education and then work experience. Yeah. And maybe even some gray hair and experience and wisdom to not chase certain things and to chase others. Yeah. yeah. And again, totally. That's right. So it's, it's that judgment. So that's what it's a decisiveness, those values that again, they come back to, we talk about wise decisive leaders because decisiveness, a lot of it is around judgment, professional and personal. When and how do you take risks? So in the 25, almost 25 years since I've graduated, the rich have gotten richer Industries like technology and hedge funds have made the richest among us not hundred millionaires, but billionaires. And never before is the gap between what a professor and his or her equally or less educated contemporaries in finance or technology, never before has that gap been wider. How does that affect the market for faculty and how you govern around things like the influence of money in the school's mission? Ooh, great question. You know, the heart of our school, like other wonderful schools, is great students and great faculty. And the combination of globalization and technology innovation are driving up the returns to talent in our world, talented individuals and talented organizations in a pretty remarkable way over the past, depending on which country and measure you look at, kind of 30 to 40 years. So this is definitely underway. And the forces of this were policy liberalization in the United States, a lot of advanced countries to liberalize trade, investment, immigration flows. It was the choice of China and India and other countries to accede into the global economy and add billions of new workers and consumers into the economy. And it's technology innovations like the fact that we're having this conversation through this amazing you know, podcast and Zoom and all that jazz. That's context to answer your question, which is faculty are high talent individuals, just like the other ones you mentioned of high talent financiers and management consultants and strategy consultants and athletes and entertainers. And so it's remarkable how competitive it is for us at the Tuck School and all of Dartmouth to try to identify, hire, retain, and motivate high talent individuals on our faculty. And you see it in 
the rising rates of compensation, you see it in the degree of competitiveness. And the other thing that I'll add is there's a spatial dimension to this inequality rising. And so part of what that means is high talent individuals tend to co-locate where they live and work around other high talent individuals because of the agglomerations and the magical kind of productivity gains and benefits that come from co-location of talent. So that's a challenge as well. More and more, we, for example, are trying to identify jobs for not just one colleague, but two. There's a partner or spouse who is more likely relative to when you were here in earlier times at talk to be another high talent individual. That intensity of competition that you mentioned, we definitely feel it in higher education. Again, it's not Dean Wormer and sleepy, uh, you know, sleepy days. Uh, at Faber, Faber was a indeed very yeah. as a dynamic marketplace for intellectual capital. Yeah, fortunately, Faber doesn't have a business school. We'd really all be <laughs> suffering. With those growing pressures for increased compensation and opportunities, money is more important than ever in higher education. Have you ever had to turn down a gift from an individual or an institution because the donor wanted to do something that wasn't in line with the mission of the organization? Uh, yes, not in a way that involved malice. And yet I think um, I come back to what I mentioned a little while ago about strategy. Strategy is about priorities and trade-offs and being able to articulate clearly we are here in this competitive landscape and we aspire to move over here. And the investments we need to build capabilities even stronger to move in that direction are these types. And so from time to time, we have an individual or family that has strong sentiments and feelings and what they would like to invest in and find partners to do that through philanthropy. And there's just been times where there wasn't enough overlap there. This is hyperbole, but to make the point, someone who comes along and says, I'm so interested and concerned about the beekeeping industry and, and, and you know, <laughs> right. it's linked to climate change and there's fewer bees and the hives are dying. Like I get that. And it's, it is fascinating, but we simply, that is not a competitive strength that talk that is not, again, of the values we, that I talked about, about lifelong learners. So someone coming along and saying, we would love to sap a current use fund or an endowment around building capabilities and beekeeping. I'd say, thank you very much, but that's just not where the school is going. So the, the Paul Ollinger Institute for Stand-Up Comedy is not something that's going to happen at Tuck. Paul, I'll be very happy to just talk about the Tuck Difference Capital Campaign with you. I'd be inspired <laughs> to find where you have, and how. Your people are on it, just yeah. so you know. I will say, you know, actually, you know, I teach the elective. I still have the pleasure of teaching. It's called Leadership in the Global Economy. We convene mock congressional and parliamentary hearings. So the learning goals are around, you know, the global economy and all this all that really important stuff. But it's also around finding your leadership voice in these high-stakes situations and humor is something that often comes up in that class. It can be a way to motivate and animate teams, but it's, you don't always carry the room. I found it very difficult to have a good sense of humor in the business world, honestly. I think that's a limitation of me. It's very easy in the day-to-day -day world. And on stage, in fact, a friend of mine who saw me on stage for the first time said, you're more relaxed on stage than you are in person. <laughs> oh, wow. So, figuring out a way to not take yourself too seriously in the business world would have benefited me greatly. No, I hear you. And I think not that the issues of our world are rising inequality of jobs, income, wealth, opportunity, hope are massively important issues for businesses in the many years ahead. And yet I kind of come back to your question about my high school buddies. If you don't have a sense of humor that you can bring with a, that balances your place in the universe, then you're going to struggle more in life. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that you spent two years, I believe it was two years, working for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. That was 2005 to 2007. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So the global economy is melting down during this period. What was it like to be in that room with those people talking about issues of such gravity? It was just at the time, my friendly member, it was just before the world financial crisis really exploded. So Tuck, like most schools, gave me generously two years leave of absence, but before which I had to return. And yet, uh, during the later part of my time there at CEA, it was clear that, for example, residential home prices in the United States and a lot of the common measures peaked in kind of spring of 2006, and the rate of growth was slowing, and some of the most intense markets were some of the most dramatic adjustments happened in Arizona and places, real estate prices were starting to fall. And so we at CEA have brought in, it's mainly academics that have an interest in policy relevant research and kind of the interaction with sovereign governments, business, civil society. So you meant to bring in kind of what does the academic and policy research say about these issues? So I can remember briefings in the Oval Office and just in the interagency process, starting to explain to colleagues, you know, house price dynamics are changing in America. Many people would then say, yes, but America has never had a concerted, substantial decline in real estate prices in the whole country. That hasn't happened. It happened in some measures in the Great Depression, but surely that's not going to happen again. And it kind of comes back to confident humility in part. 
not that I had any clear crystal ball about what exactly was going to happen, but whether it's in the highest levels of government or the highest levels of business, having people have that confidence and humility to say, oh, okay, something's changing. I don't quite know what that might mean. What should we start to be doing differently? That was definitely part of my time in the, in the closing days at CEA. And then, as you rightly say, you know, within several months, a year after that is really when a lot of these historic disruptions and chaos and capital markets took hold. Which were all easy to see in hindsight, but you're sitting there in the trenches looking at data that doesn't fit with historical models. Right, right. And, and that was a time, too, where, for example, the skewness of income growth in our economy was really taking off. I just think, remember, that by law, CEA produces a, an annual tome called the Economic Report of the President. I'm sure, Paul, you read it cover to cover like most people do. Be treating. Yeah, it's sitting right next to Fifty Shades of Grey on my nightstand. That is a wide range of literary tastes. And yet doing the charts for the 06 Economic Report of the President and having the team run and rerun measures of relative earnings by educational court. And the team found that post 2000, it was one of the first times I remember seeing, oh, even college graduates' wages have stopped growing. This first generation of the 21st century, income growth has been very concentrated at the high end of the labor market on measures like only advanced degree holders, for example, on average have had increases in earnings since roughly 2000. When data and the world seems to change, having leaders Again, have that confident humility to say, okay, tell me more. And I don't know what this means, and but what are we going to start to think or act differently about because of this? The world's been facing this challenge because it's a human challenge for centuries, and it's no different today. Where does your work provide you with the greatest joy? It's the teaching part. I love the research. It's very cool when you discover some new feature of our world that, again, through the peer review process and stuff, you, you felt you've added the knowledge. And yet the... I'm high F in the Myers-Briggs. So when you see students in the classroom or in the co-curricular settings, when you see they're really making that investment with you and it's hard and it's scary for them and you can help bring that along and bring their classmates along, that's work that brings joy. It's in a secular sense, it's sacred work. And that's the part that gives me the most joy. What's the biggest mistake you've made in your career? Being too afraid. When I have this sense for what decision needed to be made, both personally in terms of my own career trajectory and as dean, being too afraid to articulate the case for change, either in my own mind to myself or to stakeholders and talk and then move people along. This past year must have been fraught with many instances to be courageous or hide under your desk, dealing with COVID yeah. and budget constraints and uncertainty What was the hardest part of the whole thing for you and your team? Yeah, the worst day was approving and making the decision on behalf of the Tuck School to lay off 10% of our staff colleagues. I don't know that in Tuck history we had ever done that. Uh, To this day, it is difficult because these are colleagues, people whom I know in the community. And yet when I agree to serve as dean, I have to think about all the stakeholders and all the time horizons and the magnitude of the what is measurable and unknowable about this shock to all of higher education and Tuck and Dartmouth have not been immune to this. Every single kind of Ivy plus school and, and all the wonderful schools in this country are facing this, recognizing that we need to build a more resilient income statement and an ability to deliver the value for our students. The hard work we do is our students, right? And so to recognize that, to continue to make the investments in scholarship and curriculum innovation, we were going to have to run our business quite differently. That was my hardest day at professionally ever. Hardest day talk, hardest day of the crisis. Did tuition just go down? Did students not show up? What was the drop in revenue all about? Uh, the drop in revenue was we lost revenue from some of the ancillary things like room and board. And we made sure that students that felt they needed to return to extended kith or kin, we honored that. We let them go. We lost some, as a lot of institutions of higher ed did, some kind of ancillary revenue of room and board. Our costs went up quite dramatically. Investments, we needed to make sizable investments in our technology capabilities and the human capital around that to be able to deliver our classes remotely in the way the students deserved. And just also the uncertainty, the recognition that this shock, if we go back to when we were having to make all these operational decisions last March, this was before the massive monetary and fiscal stimulus. And so markets had dropped dramatically. And so a substantial part of our business model is the generosity of you alums, Paul, in real time with tuck annual giving and through the endowment, there was expected to be a substantial drop in revenues from the endowment. Now that has bounced back for the time being, fingers crossed. And I think more generally, 
higher education had a period where it has been low innovation and low productivity growth in the last part of the 20th century and tuitions throughout all of higher education, all degrees were increasing in roughly, depends on what measure, two times the general rate of price inflation. Uh, that's completely unsustainable politically and socially. And so I think what people talk about the pandemic accelerating change, it has brought forward, I think, the kind of reckoning higher education has to have with how we create value for our students and continue to deliver research as well. It's an ongoing process for us at Tuck and for all of higher ed. And while all this is going on, you're also dealing with very serious health issues in your family. How has all this combined to change your worldview? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my wife, Lindsay, who's absolutely amazing, love her more than anything in the world, even more than our two dogs. Uh, Lindsay, thank you, was diagnosed with lung cancer very unexpectedly in fall of 19, as all this was kind of crashing down in our world. Uh, so I appreciate that. I could not do my day job all these many years. It's been a partnership with Lindsay. Uh, we met in graduate school and, and it was work that brought us here. I, I was a trailing spouse. It has been hard at some level living through a global respiratory pandemic when your wife is acutely immune compromised is challenging. And yet it actually uh, was something that I think helped orient our Tuck community. I was able to personify one of the main principles that we have articulated for how we make decisions at Tuck to be transparent is to say, we're going to honor the ability and needs of each student, faculty, and staff colleague. So I was able to model that in part by just saying to people, I can't come to campus right now. It, it's, it is too dangerous for my family. And so the grace of Lindsay has been a source of strength for me and for a lot of people indirectly, I think. And I appreciate you saying that. I've heard in interviews you talk about bringing your whole self to work. It seems as if while you're not literally bringing your whole self to work physically, in every way you've got to do that to make it through these personal and professional crises over the past two years. I think that's right. I think I've realized as Dean, I have to make sure you have to be able to bring first and most importantly to make sure every student and faculty and staff colleague, how they're doing emotionally and physically and spiritually at this time. And I think I did a good job of that in the past, but like the en enormity of the need to do that is salient every single day. And you never know kind of what a day is going to bring with a colleague or with the institution collectively. And so the need to summon that energy is, Hi, I used to joke. It's interesting. I used to say, no disrespect to anybody at Tuck, but like I've never the hard when they say how hard do you work or something like that. I would say, boy, the hardest I ever worked was when I worked for the U.S. government. Your ultimate boss and client is the president, and you're serving the country. I'm a lifetime independent, so it's, it's about I viewed it deeply as serving your country. I'd never been in the military. My dad had served at the tail end of the Korean War as a Marine, and afterwards in Japan. So I had poured my all heart and soul into that role in serving the country. And yet I feel a lot of the days during the pandemic as Dean have been at least as intense, actually. You can go to the VFW and reminisce with some old guys. Where'd you serve? Infantry? No, I was in the uh, economics. I was in the supply and demand division. Yeah, supply and demand. Yeah, exactly. Not quite as important for the well-being of our country and safety of our country. But again, educated, we're building our future. We're all bringing the talents we can. Do you think bringing your yeah. whole self to work is a realistic bar for corporate America? Can companies afford uh, to do that? I think the leaders should and need to. And if they can, actually, they should step down from the job. With the amounts of compensation that their stakeholders are entrusting for those individuals, I think they actually have an obligation to do it. And if they're airmailing it in, then they, it's time for them to step aside. But to provide an environment that every single employee can walk in and be themselves 100% authentically, is that a realistic environment to strive for? I think so. Ideally, we should all work to live, not live to work. Nobody on their deathbed said, I wish I spent more time at the office. If you're going to succeed as a business, if you think otherwise, to some extent, I think you're, you're kidding yourself. I think ideally, there's a lot of organizations where people's personal aspirations and what fuels them as a broadly defined human being and what the Greeks defined as eudaimonia. You know, Aristotle and some others talked about thriving as a human being as eudaimonia, the sense that what capabilities and interests you have, you're fully flourishing when you're able to exert and, and use those. Yeah. Ideally, we can all find work that's pretty closely aligned with what animates us as people that way. They have that sense of eudaimonia of thriving. This is a geeky statement, but like match in the labor market is really important. People should ideally be able to find an, an organization to be part of that really feeds who they are as a person. That's the dream, right? To be able to find an environment where you feel at home and where you feel safe and where you can do your best work on 
encumbered by fear or other people who are going to try to keep you down or whatever it is. Yeah. And I get that's why people become entrepreneurs in a deep sense. Yes, there might be some dollars and cents vision, but I think many entrepreneurs are animated by, I want to create an organization that is as aligned as possible with who I am as a human. I think that's why corporate America, it's, it's not the right place for somebody you feel constricted to play some role as opposed to being yourself. And that stress that you feel inside is the gap between the role you're playing and who you really are. And that drives a lot of people crazy. Totally. And here at Tuck, when I speak to our students about being lifelong learners, and many of us, we stress precisely that insight, Paul, which is like, yes, you're going to have a match back in the labor market after graduation. And yet think about it as the serendipity of how your career is going to evolve. I mean, look at you as an alum. I mean, almost all of our alums, they have this very interesting, rich, idiosyncratic, serendipitous life journey, both professionally and personally. And so to get our students to be prepared for that is really important. And to have that your own sense of values, and then just checking in with how the world is evolving. And I think it's links to entrepreneurship and more generally just links to happiness as a human. What would you say to a student whose goal in life is to make a lot of money? Find a different goal. Making money should be (laughs) incidental to thriving. Can you repeat that? I just laughed over your response. I think the money should be secondary to thriving in the sense of eudaimonia. I hear this time and again, and I see it. And we've lived it as a family. Lindsay and I and our boys. If money is the ultimate goal, sit down with someone and get a different goal. You mentioned the deathbed and people not saying, I wish I'd spent more time on the office. I'm going to try to remember to say that on my deathbed, by the way, just so. Oh, good. Just I, so- you know what? I, this has been a great conversation. I will gladly come down and hold your <laughs> hand and then I'll say Paul was the exception of the rule. That's right. That's right. What would you like people to say about you after you're gone? Uh, he helped people be their better selves. He tried to care and support and love unconditionally. I like it. Last question. Do you feel rich? Yes. Most importantly, again, as a human being, I feel so lucky. I just feel very fortunate. I think when I look at the strife in the United States and around the world, it's because too many people don't feel lucky in the sense that they don't feel that the world and its constructs are providing them hope and opportunity to feel lucky about. And so I feel lucky and it kind of connects back to my work. I feel very lucky in my day job as Dean to help empower other people to do that with the different things that I do. So we need more people, not in a naive sense, to feel lucky in this world, but that would be, I not thought about that way. That's a cool, you can write that on a bumper sticker too. I like that. I think it was Yogi Berra or somebody who said, it's surprising how the harder I work, the luckier I get. Or maybe it was Harry Truman. I can't remember, but you got to put in effort. Then you feel lucky with all the things you get to do. Matt, before we take off, is there any of your writing that you would like to share with our audience? We can put links to it in the show notes. My webpage, which are awesome, Tuck Communications colleagues maintain archives, the op-eds and columns that I write for the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, places like that, interviews I do on NPR and CNBC and things like that. I have a monthly blog with a colleague, Matt Reese, called the Slafter and Reese Report that people can go to. We will put links to that in the show notes. Dean Matt Slaughter, thank you so much for joining us. Paul, this has been delightful. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Dean Matt Slaughter for making time to speak with me during a time that is no doubt very busy at school with the transition back into, quote, normalcy. And personally, with all that he's got going on with his family, I wish you the very best of health and outcomes for you and your wife. I had never spoken to Dean Slaughter before and was very happy that I got a chance to do so. I've only heard really great things about him, and obviously his academic chops are legit. But it's also great to just talk to somebody that exudes personal goodness in a way that you're like, oh, yeah, this guy's a leader because why wouldn't he be? He's the person you want in that position. All right, let's get to the takeaways. I love the concept of being able to bring your whole self to work. You could hear my skepticism, I'm sure, in those questions. I just think a very small percentage of Americans have that situation where they can be exactly who they are and bring their whole selves to work. If you are one of the fortunate few, you do work that you enjoy, that you're compensated fairly, and you can bring your whole self to work, boy, don't let go of that opportunity no matter what. I'm doing that here. I believe bringing my whole self to work in the creation of this podcast, the benefits aren't so astounding. The financial and non-financial benefits aren't so astounding other than the intrinsic rewards of talking about stuff that matters to people who are presumably interested or don't have anything else going on. Okay, secondly, confident humility. Man, this is so important because a lot of people who are humble aren't confident and a lot of people who are confident aren't humble. You got to have both. And as a leader, no matter what sphere of life you're in, business, politics, nonprofit, whatever it is, 
you've got to be confident. You got to do your work. You got to do your prep. You have to have the right intention such that you are confident, but you also have to be open to not only the things you know you don't know, but the things you don't know you don't know. And those universes are vast for me. Anyway, lastly, number three, loved his response to my question about what should you do if you meet somebody whose goal is to make a lot of money? Get another goal. All this is, of course, past a certain point of economic autonomy where you've created a life where you are able to not have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent next month, how you're going to pay your kids' tuition, medical bills, or whatever. But past a certain point, your life goal needs to be far more diverse and nuanced and respectful of who you are as a human being, and you are way more than your wallet past a certain point. Bring your whole self to work, confident humility, get another goal. Really appreciate you all sticking around to the end. If you have suggestions for guests, shoot me a note, paul at crazymoneypodcast.com, or you just want to say hi, would love to hear from you. If you have a minute, share this episode with three friends who you think would like it. Next week, more good stuff. Until then, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.